panel that put together by the students from Global Studies Society under the society's president is Angelila Oma, and she and her members did a great job. So we got they got everybody here. So I want to thank her for doing this. And so, and the goals and purpose for this panel is that there's three folds. So first, we would like to bring young professionals and experts in the international field to talk about their work and experiences. And second, we would like to bring together students from various disciplines to think about the issues we face as a global society. And we hope that we will take meaningful actions to incorporate that knowledge as we make decisions about how we live our lives and choose careers. So these are general goals and purpose for why we hope uh, we put this panel together. So next, I think now I would like to talk about review the UN's Millennium Declaration. And so in the year 2000, 189 leaders from around the world met at the Historical Millennium Summit in New York. The, so this is called UN Millennium De Development Goals for to, uh, 2015. And here I have a video I would like to show. So we can.
without doubt, these efforts take massive amounts of resource, and there are individuals, families, communities, governments, and international and local organizations that are working together to help fulfill the promise 189 countries made to the citizens of the world 12 years ago. Today, we will hear from two individuals who are part of this effort. So, but first of all, I would like to introduce you to our moderator for today's event, Dr. Spiegelberg, an assistant professor of chemistry. And Dr. Spiegelberg received his PhD in biochemistry from Duke University in 2001, and then continued his studies in pharmacology at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. He has been teaching chemistry and biochemistry at Ryder since 2008 and is currently the chairperson of the Pre-Medical Studies Committee and the Pre-Med Advisor. He will now introduce our panelists and moderate today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Wong and uh, Angelique for inviting me today, and thank you for all of you who have attended and who are watching now. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to start, first of all, with a few words from uh, Sec Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, who spoke last uh, September in New York City uh, to a panel about um, women and children's health. And, and he said, if I were to ask all of you, what is the one item you depend on most every day? I think you would take out your iPhone, Blackberry, or your cellular phone. Healthcare workers in Sub-Saharan Africa are using these same cellular phones to phone mothers, pregnant women, to tell them, so why don't you come in? Your date is fixed on such and such a day. That is quite an impressive gain, and I was so, so moved. Mobile phones, and, and Dr. Uh, or Secretary General continues, mobile phones are just one example of how technology, inno innovation, and good old-fashioned determination are combined. We need determination, leadership, and hope. We have to give hope, and we are getting results. More children are living past their fifth birthday. Fewer women are dying in childbirth. More HIV positive mothers are giving birth to HIV negative babies. But political roadblocks litter the path ahead. And this is still Sec Secretary General Martin. Decisions to invest where resources are most needed can be slow. A woman's right to access the service she needs is sometimes still denied. But those unsung heroes, trained health workers, are in desperately short supply. Women and children across the developing world still struggle with poor sanitation, dirty water, and food shortages. But, the Secretary General says, let us not lose our optimism. And so that, and, and we're ending uh, the Secretary General's words, but that's what I hope is the message here today. There's still a lot of work to do. There are still challenges, and these challenges posed by the United Nations that Dr. Wong mentioned, the, the development goals, are lofty and daunting. To give everybody primary education, to raise people out of poverty, billions of people out of poverty. They're long, lofty and daunting goals. But with the vision of the United Nations, Secretary General in particular, and with leadership from UNICEF and other organizations, real gains are being made. I think we'll hear some of that today. And so as you listen and participate in this panel discussion, what I want you to do is to consider your role in this process. If you're a student, what can you do with your life to be part of these historic gains and this historic change in the world. More than that, what should you be doing right now to prepare yourself to be part of these and future critical initiatives? If you're a faculty member or administrator, is it important to you to present global perspectives in your relationships with students? Do your scholarly activities extend beyond the borders of this campus, beyond the borders of the state of New Jersey? So today, Valentina Buch, and Fabio Verani have generously agreed to discuss with us their efforts and observations concerning the UN Millennium Development Goals related specifically to healthcare. Now as a parent, I'm a scientist, but I'm also a parent, and as a parent, I've really taken healthcare for my children and for my wife very much for granted. Fevers and ear infections, just one of those things. It's just part of life for a kid that's in a preschool, for a kid that's in kindergarten in the United States. I'm sorry, my daughter's in first grade. 
And the, the words of the pediatrician as she gives my kids the all clear, they, they barely register as I rush back to work, as I rush back to the daily grind. HIV, tuberculosis, those are things for someone else to worry about. Now, why is that? Why is that is because we have the technology, we have the know-how to help kids, to help mothers, to help eradicate or greatly reduce infectious disease. We have the technology and we have the know-how for certain people. But the question is, do we really have the know-how to ease these burdens throughout the world? And I, I suspect that we do have that know-how and I suspect that we do have the drop. And I suspect that we're gonna hear about that today. But the reality is that that's gonna take some work. It's gonna take overcoming certain hurdles and it's gonna take a, a paradigm shift to really put these things into perspective and, and to make things like millennial goals really unnecessary. I'm very happy that Ms. Boop and Mr. Verani, as part of that work and as part of that paradigm shift, are here to talk to us today. So let me introduce our two speakers and then I'll let them take it away. Uh, Ms. Boo is a, Boo is a health specialist with UNICEF focusing on malaria. She assists countries as they scale up integrated malarial inventions and she works to foster greater harmony among global malaria initiatives. Prior to joining UNICEF, Ms. Boo worked for the World Health Organization's Global Malaria Program, the International Rescue Committee, the International Organization for Migration, and the United Nations Development Program. Mr. Varani is a technical advisor, gender math, and gender health headquarters in New York City. He's an assistant professor of public policy at the Wagner School of New York University. His work has focused on promoting health and human rights, particularly those for those living in low-income communities. Prior to Engender Health, he was the senior program officer at Instituto Promundo, an NGO in Brazil that promotes gender equality and seeks to end violence against women and children. He has also served as consultant for Brazil's Center for Creation of Popular Images and Transformarte, two nonprofit organizations located in Rio de Janeiro that seek to promote health and citizenship. And so with that, I'll um, welcome Ms. Buch to the stage and uh, Thank you. Thank you both for, for coming.
accident when the child is born, undernutrition actually also contributes to at least one third of child deaths across the board. So it's a horrible cross-cutting um, intervention that we need to focus on. So again, sort of then going back to those first 30 days, unfortunately, uh, most 50% of neonatal child deaths are in the first 24 hours, and 75% of neonatal deaths occur in the first week. And as you can see, many of them are either children or born preterm. So when a woman is undernourished, she will give birth too early, so the child will not be fully developed. We have some congenital, but a lot of it is also asphyxia. So under not having enough training by the midwife who is birthing these children to understand how to clear the airways, and so unfortunately, many of these little babies just suffocate. So unfortunately, when we start to break it down by the different socioeconomic factors, it's children from poorer households, rural areas, and mothers with less education who are at higher risk of dying before age five. So you can see there that very much sort of focusing on women, ensuring that they have enough education, that they have enough nutrition, also helps to ensure the success of, the, of their children. So MVP5 is to reduce maternal mortality by three quarters from 1990 to 2015. And unfortunately, still over a quarter of a million women die every year. And over 90% 90, 90 of these are likely preventable deaths. And so unfortunately, it's still lack of training by the midwife. It's lack of understanding how to stop hemorrhaging. So on most women, unfortunately, if you give birth at home, and many of the women in Sub-Saharan Africa and in the less developed areas of the world are still giving birth at home. So having somebody there who is trained, who has very simple tools like good cord care, being able to disinfect, being able to disinfect the area right after after childbirth would help prevent many of these deaths. MDG6 is to combat HIV, AIDS, and malaria. So I broke it down one and two, what it was HIV. So unfortunately, nearly a third of all adults living with HIV are under the age of 25, and two thirds of these are women. And, and we continue to see that women are being infected far faster than, than boys. So in the 15 to 24 age group, there's still two girls infected for every boy. So we're also still seeing that an estimated 430,000 children under the age of 15 were newly infected with HIV. So and part of this is still the parent to infant transmission. So UNICEF is very much focusing on what we call the elimination of the transmission of mother to child. So this is one of our major interventions at UNICEF. And so this is my area of expertise. So I work in malaria. So there's still an estimated 225 million cases of malaria every year, which results in 800,000 deaths. And still we say that a child is dying of malaria nearly every 45 seconds. So unfortunately, malaria is still four times more likely to kill pregnant women than other adults. So unfortunately, especially women who are newly pregnant, their immune system cannot fight off the parasite. So pregnant women are highly vulnerable. And when a woman who is pregnant is infected with malaria, she's more at risk of having stillbirth, having an abortion, miscarriages, and giving birth to a low birth weight baby. So it does have effects both on the mother and on her newborn child. So girls' education, over 100 million of the world's children, two thirds of them are girls, and most of them are not in school. So, and as was mentioned before, 875 million illiterate adults, two thirds of them are women. So one of the best ways is when you can increase girls' time to school is also one way of ensuring that they have later marriage. Later marriage will ensure that then you're not having an undeveloped woman having a child. So we're also delaying pregnancy by increasing education. So we're giving them a better chance of life, not only by, by their education, but they'll have be more likely to have a healthier baby, and they themselves will have a healthier pregnancy and a healthier life. So UNICEF also very much focuses on social protection, so gender and violence against women. So and ensuring that we can protect as many children and as many women. So unfortunately, we're still seeing that girls between 13 and 18 co constitute the largest group in the sex industry. So it is estimated that still every year, 500,000 girls below the age of 18 are victims of trafficking every year. So we're also seeing, unfortunately, that there has been a great focus on re reduction of female genital mutilation, but it's still affecting 130 million girls and women. UNICEF also does a lot of work in emergencies. So this is areas where we're seeing um, uh, either post-conflict transition, so as in DRC, where I met, where I met Hector, or sort of focusing on acute emergencies, sort of as what we're seeing in Haiti or when we see post-cyclone or post-war. UNICEF has a huge focus on ensuring that people get the right health care, that there's social protection, that there's refugee camps are well set up, that you can actually protect people as much as, as, much as possible. So I thought I'd focus a little bit on sort of what is UNICEF. So a lot of people sort of see UNICEF through our greeting cards, you know, 
child to development, sports, and emergency. So because our mandate is up until the child is 18, so we do focus on maternal health, child health, and adolescence. So we have a budget of about $4 billion, of which 60% is spent on health. And we're supported entirely by voluntary funds. So two thirds of it comes from governments and one third comes from what is called the National Committee. So these are our outreach in developed countries who will work with corporate sponsors, who work with wealthy individuals who reach out and sort of recoup funds which we can then turn into programming to ensure that children and mothers are, are protected. So as I mentioned, how do we work? We, we influence donors and companies to do the right thing. We work on advocacy. We also do a lot of what I spend my time doing, which is technical assistance, working with governments, working with international NGOs to ensure that the money that is being put into countries is being spent correctly, critiquing national malaria control programs to ensure that they're actually being the most effective and ensure that people are protected from malaria. We also help them leverage countries and governments to get the money that they need to do to achieve their goal. So working with the Global Fund to Fight AIDS TB and Malaria, working with the World Bank, working with, with USAID, working with all of these areas to ensure that, the, that we're getting as much money as possible towards meeting these goals. And then UNICEF is also highly specialized. We have another headquarters in Copenhagen which where we work on procurement. So we have people who are specially trained on logistics who actually help ensure that all of these amazing commodities like lead nets, antiretrovirals, vaccines, chain from ordering them from the factory actually gets them into the field and gets them to the people who need them most. So going back a little bit more into UNICEF's focus on health, because we have such a strong field presence, we're actually very much like an inverted pyramid. So we have a very small headquarters. We have these two headquarters which are based in, in New York and in Copenhagen, but our strongest presence is actually on the ground, which ensures that we're closest to the people who need it most. So and our main question is not just an intervention work, but we always use evidence-based interventions so we're ensuring that it's scientifically based that this is the most effective way of getting up coverage. So which ones will have the greatest impact, especially for the poorest children? Our biggest focus is on equity, is getting to that last mile, is getting to that last 20% to ensure that it's poor rural children who get, our, who get our interventions. We also often do packages of interventions. So for instance, when I'm doing bed net distributions, I'll also do vaccine distributions at the same time or nutritional interventions because it, it is the most cost-effective way of ensuring delivery. We're often working on human resources, doing a lot of training to ensure that people, as I was mentioning before, working with community health workers, that they can ensure that they can diagnose and deliver the right interventions, working with midwives so that they can recognize the subject emergencies quickly and get that woman to the right health facility. And then we also work a lot on resolving bottlenecks. What are the problems? Is it a problem with procurement? Is it that you don't have a good warehouse? Is it that you can't keep your cold chain to ensure that those vaccines are actually effective by the time they get out to the field? So we do a lot of problem solving in the most basic ways. It's one of the reasons why we actually also have an incredible innovations unit who's working at that edge to ensure that we're getting solar refrigerators to ensure that we keep that cold chain all the way out to 39 degree weather. So what type of interventions do we scale up? So these are the interventions which have the greatest impact in children one to 59 months. So one of the simplest ways is actually exclusive breastfeeding. So training women to breastfeed for a minimum of six months, preferably up to two years, will actually help ensure that the women that their children have the greatest chance of life just by this very simple, very natural, effective way of, of protecting them. Doing ORS and zinc for diarrhea is actually one of the most neglected interventions. It's something as simple as sugar and salt water will actually help prevent diarrhea, which is the second largest killer of children. So it's quite simple. And zinc is being found as a cofactor, which is quite extraordinary in increasing immunity and ensuring that you can increase both your immunity as an adult, but also children's immunity and protect them against many, many of these killer diseases. So we, fo we focus on this continuum, which is the protect, prevent, and treat approach. So what we're talking about protecting is protecting against exposure. So when I take it back to my disease, which is malaria, sort of the distribution of bed nets actually has a protective effect. And what's extraordinary about bed nets is that it's not just a personal protective effect in preventing the mosquito from biting you, but when you get enough coverage of the insecticide, I start to actually protect the community. So there's actually enough insecticide, the mosquitoes land on the bed net, they're killed, and the mosquito population goes down, which reduces transmission. When we're preventing illness, if, if an exposure does occur, it's things like immunization. So even if you are exposed to, say, a rotavirus, if you can immunize against it, then you will be preventing illness in this way. But then we also focus on, we can protect and we can prevent everything. So we also focus in on treatment. So ensuring that things like antibiotics, antimalarials, and this very simple ORS and zinc are actually available in the community as part of UNICEF's work. We focus on these three different intervention channels, which are family and community. So the schedule or outreach services, so working out into the community, working with
integrate health facilities and health codes, but then also training people who are actually in the health codes or who are in the hospital. So these are the RPD delivery channels. As I mentioned, there is a huge amount that we could prevent. As I said, ORS will prevent up to 15% if we could scale it up enough, and breastfeeding will, pre will prevent 13% of many of these total deaths of these 8.8 .8 million deaths. And you can see there the different percentages that just scaling these things up will actually help reduce these 8.8 .8 million deaths that we see every year. So what are some of our key challenges? And some of our key challenges is that unfortunately for families, many of these illnesses are completely catastrophic because most of their expenses have to be out of pocket. So there is unfortunately not enough government financing and as much as we try to scale up free distributions to free healthcare, most of these families are going to have these catastrophic losses by having to pay for treatment, pay for the facility, pay, I mean, I've, I've seen in some cases where you actually have to pay for the bed that you're gonna be lying in when you're at a hospital. So it really can be catastrophic in terms of destroying the little financing that people have. So UNICEF is also focusing, one of the biggest problems is actually getting the data, where are the problems, where are people dying? So UNICEF focuses a lot on increasing data, increasing our monitoring and evaluation to ensure that we're actually seeing where our interventions have the greatest impact and continue building this evidence base. So, but as I mentioned, beyond health, we also need to ensure that we're focusing in on development. We do see that people's health indicators go up as their development and as their socioeconomic power, their spending power goes up. They can protect themselves and their families better. And unfortunately, one of the biggest problems is even as we're focusing on developing the public sector, many families will still go to the private sector because they are their guaranteed of service. But you, for that, you need to have enough money to actually get into the private sector. We need good governance. Unfortunately, political will is incredibly important for ensuring that there's investment in the right diseases, that people understand that you need to get out there, you need to treat diarrhea, you need to treat pneumonia, you need to treat malaria. So good governance is extraordinarily important. And as I mentioned, one of our biggest focuses is distinctly on female education. Well-educated women who marry later, who deliver later, are the best chance that we have of protecting children. I'm gonna stop there. So I'm gonna leave you with a few slides if you wanted to go through, which is our specific malaria initiative, which is, which is my main focus, but I will hand over here to Claudia.
So, and uh, I'll speak a little bit about uh, two of them, which I think uh, we can make a better a better uh, connection with. And obviously, promoting gender equality and empowering women falls within the work of Engine Health, and it's primarily the work of the Gender Men's Partners Team, uh, which focuses very much on promoting gender equality. Um, so, um, the way it's measured for the uh, MDGs, I guess, it is, is primary and secondary in education. Uh, promoting gender equality is obviously not something that's going to happen in 2015. Uh, it is much, much, much longer range goal uh, than that. Um, so they, the, just one statement I had taken from the declaration itself that they do understand the UN had understood that gender equality and power of women being, as being uh, effective ways to do other things, including combat hunger uh, and disease, poverty and disease. Um, so we work within, within this goal, we do work to promote gender equality, but we also, uh, the men as partners part of this is to focus uh, a good amount on men and to understand that we need to, to make sure that men are involved for us to achieve any sort of gender equality. Um, and then maternal health, uh, which is one of, the one of the areas in which gender health focuses quite a bit, um, and not just in the mortality, which I think is the, the main measure for the MDGs, but also the morbidity. And, uh, and it's very, like, as I mentioned, the fistula, uh, we do work quite a bit with preventing and very much uh, treating fistulas, which is an outcome of um, uh, poor maternal health and poor maternal health, uh, poor response to, uh, to delivery, uh, especially to complications. So a lot of the women that we see in the fistula care program have spent two or three days, sometimes even more, uh, um, in labor. Really, only supposed to spend up to 12 hours before you go, uh, you, before you have to go to some sort of uh, uh, skill delivery. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't happen in many countries, and um, so the one of those one of the things we we try to do in the terms of prevention, we've tried more and more, is to think of how we can engage men uh, in facilitating access of women to antenatal care and in uh, delivery and guaranteeing delivery in a health facility. Uh, but we also recognize that often for a lot of these women, men, their partners are themselves a barrier to this kind of care. Uh, sometimes they don't see the added value in terms of money uh, to transport, to, to send their wives to, uh, to, to have antenatal care and to deliver in a health facility. Um, and there's also an issue with, the tra uh, with traditional midwifery, which I guess is also related to gender. So it's generally uh, a female job and it's one of the one of one of the relatively fewer jobs that women have access to, um, and it's uh, in many countries. Um, and so then there is there is kind of a um, how would I say um, uh, there is an incentive for them to want to keep uh, women with them as opposed to refer women to skilled health delivery. Right. So within that, I think there uh, there has to be some recognition of these dynamics uh, to go beyond sometimes only training uh, tra tra traditional midwives understand their socioeconomic issues in terms of trying to get, uh, get meaningful, gainful employment. Uh, in gender health, um, so we work, uh, the gender area works with what we call gender transformative programming. And I'm not going to go over this because this can get a little bit um, you know, technical. But basically, gender transformative programming means programming that understands that we need to transform social norms. So um, there is programming that may engage gender and understands that we have to um, to give priority access to women for certain things that we have to uh, address, uh, uh, disaggregate data and look at data differently. But those sometimes those programmings are sensitive, but they don't really seek to transform any of these relationships or to transform the social norms that make them possible. Um, so, and the reason that we do this in, in terms of the men is that many of the attitudes and beliefs, many of the things that men, uh, not only men, men and women in society hold as expectations to what it means to be a man in, the, in society, many of these beliefs are very correlated with uh, domestic violence or gender-based violence, with multiple partnership, uh, with self-reported STI symptoms, with condom use or lack thereof, uh, refusal to wear condom, condoms, and to also sub substance and alcohol use. Um, so there's a range of kind of within these of kind of risk-taking behaviors that men are encouraged to to engage in. Um, 
these are very much based on the kind of expectations that we have about what it means to be a man or a woman in our society. Right? And then for women, these waves can also can often be ones that are more related to being passive and accepting uh, of situations within their relationships, and including sometimes that uh, So we still partners, but men as partners, we work with an ecological model, and I don't know if you've ever heard this, but basically that means that we understand that change does not happen on just one level. Right? It does not just happen on an individual level. You need communities to go through change, you need service delivery institutions to go through change, and you need, you need policy and advocacy to support change. Um, so very uh, very specifically for institutions, um, or, or thinking all of these all of these levels that are, are involved in reproducing the norms and the expectations that we have about men and women. Right? So it is individuals, friends, families, peers, that pass on what you should, should or should not do, what is expected, what is considered masculine, not masculine, feminine, not feminine, but also communities uh, in a larger sense. Uh, institutions are also very gendered, right? Many institutions, such as the educational system, can push and pull men and women in different directions based on the expectations uh, or stereotypes. And policy, legal, uh, legal avenues can also do the same. So in that, in that sense, we try to work within this, uh, the ecological model. We work with group workshops, which are workshops to engage groups of men and women to reflect about uh, their own ex the, the expectations they have uh, about what it means to be a man or a woman, uh, how this has affected their relationships, to see some of the costs that might be involved in very rigid uh, traditional norms, and to, to be able to question and challenge those in, inwards in terms of their own relationships, but also to be able to do that with their friends and family. And then communities, we work with campaigns, community events, to try to get the community as well to reflect about these issues. And service delivery, we work a lot with health providers to get more health providers to reflect on providers' attitudes that can um, compromise, in some sense, their, their ability to, to provide service to, to different groups. Um, so for example, for a lot of the work with MAP in the past, a lot of the reproductive health programs are set up in many countries to really primarily focus on women. And they're so marketed to that extent that men don't see themselves as having an avenue or a space within reproductive health, sexual reproductive health. And many workers are trained to primarily treat uh, young girls or women and often may see young men especially as kind of adversaries, like people who cause problems, uh, people who cause violence, who refuse to, to use condoms, um, so work has to sometimes be done within reproductive health uh, since to help kind of think about uh, how providers can, can, uh, can work with men. Uh, so basically what we do, we, uh, the gender map team does capacity building for our health, uh, our health programs in the field and for some of the staff and, and headquarters in New York. Um, so we also develop some training materials. We have quite a lot of them. Develop, adapt trainings, trainings of facilitators, trainings of trainers uh, in field, co field country, uh, field offices. Um, and then we also kind of take the lead uh, within the organization to try to look at new directions, including gender synchronization. Uh, and gender synchronization is just something that means that uh, though there's been a lot of work, there's a lot of work with women in kind of uh, one area of empowering women and girls, and a lot of work with just with men and engaging men to be partners, but uh, there is very little work uh, doing both at the same time. Right? So kind of the work with women has become siloed and the work with men is siloed. And the idea of gender synchronization is realizing that, that gender is relational, it's constructed by men and women together, it's not constructed by men separately and women separately, and that we need to th think of ways to make sure that our programming engages, engages both men and women uh, from the beginning. Uh, these are some of the countries where we work and some of the different types of programs that, that we work. Uh, and gender health actually works in more countries. These are, these are some of the primary uh, countries where we're focusing on gender and uh, women's partners work. Um, and outside of these, I think India and, and Burundi also are making moves. Um, and a lot, of the work, so, uh, a lot of the recent work has been around GDP. Um, and just to mention quickly, in the field itself, uh, what does work? We found it works a lot of the gender transformative approaches, which is trying to change social norms, trying to challenge the uh, inequitable uh, norms, attitudes, beliefs. Uh, 
integrated efforts, uh, so like the ecological model I mentioned, working with individuals and group workshops, working in the community, working with mass media, and working with uh, health service data. Um, and then dialogue and common cause with women's rights and girls' rights efforts, uh, which has been, which is a fundamental um, uh, principle uh, for a lot of us, but of course it's something that doesn't happen as much. Uh, so the health area as a whole doesn't always see its interaction with women's rights, with the women's rights movement. And within the gender, uh, gender equality movement, as it were, we definitely see that we have to have common cause with women's rights movements. Um, and then discussing a range of issues when we do this gender transformative approach. So it's not just talking about men and their attitudes in terms of HIV and maternal health. You have to recognize that there are uh, a plurality of different avenues where um, uh, men and women um, pass on behaviors, attitudes that may be more equitable. Okay, so then, uh, so I'm gonna try to speak a little bit about um, some of the personal reflections, I guess, that I've been working. Um, so basically, again, doing this work, and I've been doing the gender part of the gender work since I started with Institute of Mundo, so, um, and then now within gender health, so it's been, I guess, five or six years. And then previously, I was with HIV human rights. Um, so, um, uh, one thing I can say that I feel in terms of being able to do this is privilege. Um, privilege in being able to to go to many, many different countries and listen to and participate in workshops where men and women reflect about what it means to be a man or a woman in their uh, context, social context, and then within their, con their country, within the specific context of where they are. Um, so one of the one of the things that come that comes that's come through a lot of that is that uh, we do something that's called a gender box exercise, which is a very uh, very used kind of a activity in a lot of sexuality and uh, gender equality type of uh, activities. And basically, this activity is trying to, to think help the group think of you know, what is the expectation for men, what is the expectation for women. And these are kind of referred to as boxes sometimes, as they box people in in terms of what is expected. Uh, these are these are uh, miraculously similar uh, around the world. Uh, there are differences. There are definitely many uh, complexities. And in fact, there are definitely many versions of masculinity and femininity in any country, in any uh, context. Uh, but that said, there's still a huge amount of similarity. So we often, uh, almost everywhere I've ever been, men are always expected to be the provider, still, to some extent, to, to be strong, to exert power, to exert control, to be the head of the family. Um, and that women are generally expected to be the caregivers, the primary caregivers, to be more passive, and to take on the majority of domestic labor. Right? And that pans out here. In the United States, we still we have the same thing. Women, women are the first ones to, to sacrifice their careers. They're the first ones to take more flexible, part-time employment than men post-pregnancy. Uh, uh, so men's careers generally do not get very much impact childbearing and, and raising a family. Uh, and this you can see almost everywhere around the world. Um, so, and, we have, and I think that's why it is kind of a, global, a globalized phenomenon. And you can think of a lot of places in, in Africa or in, or in Asia, the, the extent to which a lot of the media that we generate, which is very gender inequitable, is very much a part of those cultures as well. So that includes movies, which have very, uh, very rigid stereotypes of men and women. Uh, that includes uh, music, uh, which has a huge impact around, around many, uh, in many of the countries. Um, so, and then I think, as I mentioned before, while fitting in a box, men tend to take risks, delay health seeking, uh, and help seeking. And they have higher rates of suicide, generally higher rates of uh, drug and alcohol abuse, and higher rates of homicide. So. So women tend to experience GBV at much higher rates than men, but uh, men tend to, to experience violence from men at higher rates than women. So homicides, so and are tend to be the majority of homicide perpetrators as well as the majority of homicide victims, the vast majority. Uh, and socially, if you think about it, this hegemonic uh, or dominant masculinity uh, also impacts on criminality, um, other other behaviors that are associated that are not necessarily health behaviors, um, 
and then allow being able to do have these kinds of discussions around different uh, contexts, different countries, does allow me as well to reflect more and more about how I interpret these things and how they work kind of in a globalized fashion, um, not just kind of isolated from this, to my own experience. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, and then also, uh, I'm going to speak very quickly about a project that we I had done in Brazil uh, when I was at Promundo. And I think I picked this one because it was, um, it has had a lot of challenges. And then, then I think the, the, the rewards are more qualitative, they're less uh, quantifiable. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, we'll see. They're still doing, they're still fin finalizing the some of the, the, the evaluation. But, um, so it was uh, adversity and success in the sense that we had, uh, this was a uh, UN funded pro uh, UN trust fund, a UN trust fund to eliminate violence against women that funded this program. And we had, um, uh, Promundo was originally supposed to work with the state's employer to do an employee, uh, 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 an employee based program. And these state employers, because they're states, uh, government, they're state governments, uh, Corporations, they're very bureaucratic, and we ended up that we couldn't get through the final stages uh, in any way, near shape uh, or form, of the time that we needed to do things. So we had to we had to give up on them because they would just take too long. So then we had to go another route. The route that we went was to work in a community called Santa Marta, which is a favela in, in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, and um, we worked with them to to develop kind of a, to to recruit men. Uh, and this is a study, the idea was really to recruit men to see uh, the impact of engaging men in uh, gender equality in terms of prevention of gender-based violence. Um, so there's a theory of change a lot of times for a lot of the programming um, that if men are more equitable, they will be less violent. And the idea is then to try to engage men to reflect on not just things with re regarding violence, but regarding relationships, regarding um, their expectations about themselves and about women, uh, and start to start to challenge those things, and then also to engage in a specific uh, discussion about violence. Uh, so, um, for these kinds of studies, when you try to get large numbers of people, there's different ways you can try to recruit. Right? But the reality of the, of the matter is that you're always offering something to young men, to, to the men to come in. For the women. Um, most men or women do not want to are not going to volunteer to spend a significant portion of time talking about the. This was a 16-week intervention, so there's 16 weeks uh, of uh, one meeting per week. So it was pretty intense on their part. Um, and the reason we picked 16 for a lot of the BCC or 14 is um, you have to have a certain amount of hours of contact to really talk about things and have people reflect and be able to to to, to get to any sort of change. Um, so we so we used basically football, uh, soccer, as it were, and that was the that was the strategy to recruit. So we offered them a football championship um, in the community of Santa Marta, uh, where there were actually a lot of informal championships, so we just sort of made it a little bit more formal. And we used it also as an opportunity to become a kind of a community event and engage uh, the community and, and, um, uh, and use it as a communication piece. So uh, having a football championship is relatively expensive, and it's not worth it just to bring people into workshops. So we used it as an avenue for communication in the community. Uh, and on that level, we do think it was, I do think it was successful in the sense that practically no one didn't know that this, that this uh, uh, championship was going on and they didn't know what it was about. I mean, they all knew what it was about. Um, so, um, so we used this, uh, one of the, it's a tiny football field. And one of the things we noticed is that one of the, that one of the teams in the second week made a banner, which is the one underneath the big one. Themselves, and they support the, the white ribbon campaign. The uh, white ribbon is actually an international campaign. We use, we use the white ribbon because it's something that already pre-exists. It's an international campaign of men to end gender-based violence. Um, so they they made their own banner saying that they supported the the campaign and, and the prevention of gender-based violence. Um, so then this is just so the, the the level of um, participation of the community. So it became quite a big. Event. Uh, and so, not, so there was quite a lot of uh, participation. We had done a lot of communication work in the communities. We did uh, newsletters, we did community events, 
uh, trying to engage as much as much of the Toda community, uh, which is the favela itself is about uh, 5,000 people, uh, more or less. Um, and our, our feels that we probably got close to, to most of the most people, with, with some, with some uh, level of, of indeed, uh, at least the, the print media. Uh, and then we also did posters, of course, and flyers and all these other things to, to try to engage the community in the same reflection that the men were going through. So very much that ecological model I mentioned before, not just individual uh, re reflection, but getting the community to also think about these issues as well, and putting this out in the community. Um, so, um, and so uh, I'm going to show a quick six minute clip. Okay. Um, and um, I think I might end with that afterwards. But um, so this is a clip from a person called Marcio, and he participated in the football championship itself. And he also participated in a program that we had just before that was a fatherhood program to, to get men to reflect about fatherhood and how to become engaged fathers. Um, and, and I think it's, it's interesting because it does provide some of a personal reflection of his about what it means, this little the issue of fatherhood. And I think he gives a quick uh, comment about, uh, about, about the work of, uh, not just the work of Komundo actually, about this type of work. So, Seis anos, né? 
coisas que foram absorvidas dos outros, sabe? Das ideias, os conceitos das outras pessoas, sabe? Muita coisa assim, tudo que eu achava de ser pai mudou e acabou que eu abri. Porque, tipo assim, coisas minhas entram, saíram, coisas boas entraram. Assim, minha esposa, tipo, a Verônica ficou grávida e ela foi o primeiro pré-natal. Eu nunca faltei uma reunião de pré-natal dela, nunca fui, nunca faltei uma consulta de pré-natal. Me sentia mais, o meu filho se sentia, se sentia mais próximo de mim. Too, is Marceau is, um, you know, with his background, he could have really gone both ways. And many times you find, find men who come from, men and women, who come from families where there's violence and this kind of uh, relationship, they tend to go on and replicate the same thing. It's the, it's the number one, I think, uh, number one risk factor for you becoming a perpetrator of violence or becoming a woman who is a survivor or a victim of violence is having had parents who were violent, right? having had that as a, as a model to what but there are many men who come out of these experiences and women saying that this is exactly what I don't want. And that's what Marcel did. He came out of that really clear that he did not want to, to have the same experience. Um, but he also locked it in for a long time before he was able to actually to kind of speak to this. Um, so the last part I was going to mention is that uh, besides all of this, um, this, obviously working with this kind of issue, you can't really uh, pretend, right? You can't. You're not vaccinating people. Right? So you have to actually be able to have gone through this and be able to kind of speak to these issues genuinely. Right? Especially with young men and young women, uh, they, will, they, will, they will notice in a second if you're not being genuine, right? if you're pretending, right? if you're kind of being politically correct. Uh, so you definitely have to go beyond it. So that's why there's also, some of which we, we talk about a lot, is that this is kind of something that has to be personalized. Uh, it can't be just at the level of we, you know, we think gender equality is right. It has to be much, much deeper than that. Otherwise, it's not going to resonate with anyone. So doing this kind of work has allowed me to do that, to question, to reflect about these uh, these issues myself in ways that I hadn't before, uh, much like Marceau did. 
Um, the answer reflected by my own upbringing, my own experiences, my own relationships. Um, I think it's made, I think it's made it made, made those better actually for me. Um, and it's also allowed me to build up to do a lot more of questioning or challenging people than I probably would have ever before. And this, I mean, in a private sphere, I mean, like at work. Um, and um, it also, it also, uh, some a friend of mine once said, said this, a coworker. The gender is a really wonderful lens to see the world. Uh, it is kind of like you can see it's, it's everywhere. There's nowhere you can't look. Uh, there's not a gender. It's always there. Um, so uh, everything you watch, movies, media, uh, advertising, uh, the people around you, it's, it's there. It's always there. Um, these kind of assumptions that we have from a long time of what is expected from us. Um, and then just uh, this is my last slide. So just to mention. Uh, some issues with the gender integration, um, and uh, this is something that comes up with a lot of, I think, especially more maybe uh, feminist authors themselves reflect on this, um, which is uh, this whole process of integration. What does it in fact mean? Uh, which it kind of has gone through a little bit with the MDGs as well, a lot of the gender mainstreaming, a lot of gender integration, and to what extent, you know, is this going to get us, and where is it going to get us? Um, so one of one of the issues that people bring is that. Feminism, fem feminism began and was a social and political movement. Um, and uh, to what extent does some of the gender integration happen is depoliticize that movement, uh, take it out of politics and make it institutional. Um, um, there's an impact as well with, health, with the health focus that goes to a lot of the gender equality work, and which means that a lot of women's rights organizations uh, around the world are becoming less and less funded because people are funding their money towards health outcomes and not towards human rights or trans organizations. Um, and then what, to what point are people really just kind of going through the motions and not really uh, reflecting, not really wanting to challenge uh, inequities within, uh, between gender, but are more really just kind of ticking the box for, you know, we did a gender analysis, so we, you know, we addressed gender, uh, even if it wasn't really, really seen as important. In the same way, like with, as, as if you can think of every single ministry of gender that exists or ministry of women's rights, it is at the bottom of the ministry total at the very bottom. Uh, and sometimes it's not even the ministry. And very often, I always like to say it's the ministry of the seven. It's the ministry of women, children, social development. It's all the things that are kind of less uh, put together. And it's never, it's never, almost never, a ministry of just one thing. That's how they make it. That's how they make it. I think I'll leave it there. That was a fascinating uh, sort of coincidence of, of what you guys covered because it's, it's certainly clear from what Valentina talked about that empowering women is, uh, you know, I'd say, would you agree that it's at the heart of one of the things that, that needs to be done to, to, to get through? I mean, it, it strikes a chord with children's health, with, of course, with women, maternal health and, and empowering women, um, you know, just understanding their role and what needs to be done, say, who gets pregnant? Is it a 12 or 13 year old girl that gets pregnant versus a, a woman that's, that's been able to develop physically and, and, and emotionally? Um, you know, all the way to even prevention of disease and transmission of disease. That, that empowering women is such a such an important part of that, a crucial part of that, and, and something that will have real gains. And then and have Fabio talk about men's roles in that. I think is something that, that is, is obviously um, something that's, that sometimes gets missed. And so. I wonder, as you guys get started, I wonder if, if what sort of things we can do as, as students here at Ryder. If, if I'm a student at Ryder, what sorts of holes do you see in, in sort of the personnel and trying to get these messages across? What, what can I do as a student? Um, what should I be doing with my life? Trying to make a difference. And did that start? What do you, what do you guys see? How, how can we help? Um. Well, I'll just, I'll just say just specifically for the work that I do with gender transformative programming, um, there aren't enough people. We don't we really, especially in certain parts of the world. So in certain parts of the world, we have a hard time 
identifying people who can be consultants, who can be uh, trainers, who can be facilitators of workshops. There's not that many. Um, that would be very much true, for, especially for West Africa. Um, very, very hard to find people who are uh, gender in terms of gender transformation uh, experts in West Africa. Um, so French speaking, Consult and work on this. That's something that you don't see, you don't have as much. Um, so, so that's that's a, a big lack for us. Um, and um, I think there's other places too that that would be true. Latin America has quite a bit of work. Um, Southern Africa has a good amount of work in the areas that, that are local and work with these issues. Asia, in terms of India, does, but East Asia actually and Southeast Asia don't, uh, especially in East Asia. Um, so I think there's some. That is another area that we don't have as much impact. China and Southeast Asia. Um, to follow up on that, do you think that's not only related to um, the uh, qualification of the individual, but also to the circumstances surrounding the, the culture? Is it? Yeah, I don't. I really don't think it's it's necessarily cultural. I think it's. Um, I, I, just, I just think historically there wasn't that much work. And, I mean, when I say that there are, there are people who do this in Southern Africa, there's actually there's only a handful of NGOs as well. Um, uh, so I just don't think that there was historically much of a focus working there. Um, and I guess there's less literature in French in general. There's actually not that much focus on this issue in France, per se. So there's much less French language material. There's a lot of English language material that came, a lot of work in Australia, for example, that was very huge in terms of this issue of masculinity, and that's accessible to people who are in, in the English countries in Southern Africa and East Africa. And there's quite a bit of work in Portuguese and Spanish, too. So it makes it easier for people to speak. Can, although Angola doesn't have that much work, mostly because quite a lot. Um, so I think it might be more language and just experience. I don't think it's cultural. say we're empowering men because men generally have power and they usually have a lot of power over uh, over some of the women in their lives um, including the ability to lead when there's a pregnancy as opposed to actually having to stay up and dealing with it and I think 
part of that, I think, is, is engaging men and reflecting about what they think uh, about sexuality and reproductive health and pregnancy. And a lot of countries, a lot of studies, young men compared to young women don't see themselves as reproductive. Like they don't see sex as a reproductive act. They see it as ex exclusively a pleasure, an act for a pleasure. So the consequences aren't, aren't even framed in their head from the beginning. So I think it is a question of kind of getting men to reflect about some of these, uh, some of these issues. And really, in, in, in the United States, is we need to have some more uh, comprehensive sexuality and, and sexual education for young men and women. Um, so, um, so I would say those two things in terms of advocacy. Is for anyone who can advocate for those things, it's very good. There's a there's a network called Men Engage, which is an alliance which and gender help help to to found, and there was a petition that we put up about uh, uh, men in support of women's reproductive health. So if you are able to find it, I would definitely, this is more for, for it, this is a statement for men to support, but I think we've had women signing on as well, of course. Actually, probably more women, this is the way it always pans out, even though we're trying to get men in all, but <laughs> the issues are so much more relevant sometimes, and men don't see the relevance, unfortunately, a lot of times. Uh, but the idea is really to challenge a lot of the political things that have been happening in the United States in terms of funding the board for um, reproductive health programs. Tend to, I mean, we kind of tend to make a distinguishing, we distinguish between equality and equity, so we tend to focus a lot on uh, gender equality as the outcome that we want, meaning that men and women have the same, uh, um, how do I say, um, uh, same chances and same opportunities uh, regardless of their sex. Um, but then there's also gender equity, which is trying to realize that we live in a world where there is inequity, there is not equality, and we need to think of ways, sometimes things that are Tools that seem to be not equitable or not equal in terms to try to, in terms of trying to get to equality. So things like quotas. In a lot of countries, they have quotas for representation in government. Um, say what you will or, or won't. I mean, it, it is a strategy. It is definitely a gender equity strategy, but not an equality strategy because it is giving preferential access to some of these things. Um, um, so that's that's one issue. The other issue too is not is not to make a false symmetry. There's really one major biological difference between men and women, and that's um, pregnancy. Uh, and for example, in the United States, we have kind of a false symmetry. Right? Women don't have a leave uh, because men don't have leave. Right? So we don't have any paid leave because it's, it would be kind of not equal. But in reality, it has nothing to do with it because biologically, men and women are different. And most countries recognize that. In most countries, the more advanced Scandinavian countries, for example, have both. Leave for women, uh, maternal leave and paternal leave. Uh, and the idea with paternal leave is to try to stimulate and give avenues for men to participate too. Because if you, if women get six months or a year off of work, but men are only working, it only kind of replicates the stereotype that caregiving is a woman's job and it's not a man's job. So I guess that's that's some of it. And then I think there's a lot of false symmetries with the violence issues too. Women yeah. experience much more violence than men, but there's a lot of, especially very predominantly in the United States, a lot of uh, attempts to kind of make a, what I think is a false symmetry between the experiences of men and women in terms of violence. Yes, um, a question. Um, the exposure to like It's really 
ahead. Go ahead. Um, how can someone get involved in like helping with your organizations? Like, do you guys offer internships or? The USSO, the UN agencies all offer internships at the master's level. So at a certain point, you need to have sort of mm -hmm. drill down a little bit into what you're interested in, and they get published on our website, the USSO.org employment site, publishes when the internships are, are available. So they're very, very competitive. It's also a lot of people because they're unpaid. So if you wanna, <laughs> wanna, you've got to balance out sort of, do I want to work for a UN agency and sort of see what it, what it looks and what, what it's like and which one, because the UN is huge. I mean, there's so many different areas. That's why I say you need to figure out a little bit the lens of what you're interested in. Do you want to go on the political side? Do you want to go into the ECOS talk chamber? Do you want to go into the human rights side, go to the UNHCR? Do you want to be on the ground? There is a program called the UN, Volunt the UN Volunteers, which will send you for a year to two years out into the field and pay you minimally. But they cover your housing and those sorts of things. There's one way, I mean, I know a lot of friends who they started off in Kosovo and then they worked their way up because then they knew. But you need to decide, do I want to go on the health side? Do I want to go on the politics side? Do I want to go on the human rights side? What What is it that drives you? So it's kind of a, a both sides. You know, the UN will contribute to you as much as you contribute to it. Um, well, we're just one organization, so, so I think uh, we don't have any internships because uh, we actually have to pay for internships, and that makes it hard for us to we end up usually finding more recruiting junior staff than actually applying to do internships. And the same thing usually after staff persons have already gone through your master's programs. And usually we're looking, you know, if it's a health organization, so, but it's not exclusively uh, MPHS, they're not necessarily public health students. Some of them are social work, some of them are psychology, some of them are, are med students or are, I mean doctors. And some of them are, are social sciences. There's, there's, there's things, there, there's, I mean, there are laws that are very usually inequitable in a lot of countries. And, um, I didn't really address in my presentation, one of the things that we, we, we 
we address a lot is homophobia and issues around sexual orientation. And in many countries, it's a crime still. It's a, and some countries like Uganda are still kind of persistent in very, very negative, um, um, very negative um, attempts to, to put um, even harsher penalties as it were. And I think actually, Yeah, there's a legal sanctions for the, in terms of uh, kind of sustaining homophobia in the larger sense. And then I think uh, a lot of countries don't have le legislation about domestic violence. Like domestic, or the legislation is like the legislation, especially in the back of the country, legislation that was on the books from the colonists. And it's outdated. It's like 150 years old. And it has concepts about domestic violence that don't really apply anymore. Are you balancing out properly the, the human rights issues there? One of the, one of the things that people thought was empowering Understanding the interactions between them, I think, is an interesting point. I think in both the work we do, community is incredibly important. Communities will often tell you what their bottlenecks are, what the, what the things are, how to make them work. And having to work really with local physicians, I mean, one of the oddest things we've had to do was in Beijing was actually get the witch doctors to go out and discuss the use of those malaria medications and the use of bed nets. Because malaria was always seen as a possession by the spirit. So when we got to the witch doctors and educated them, they then went back to their the white bed nets, it's not a spirit thing, use the medication, the medication will cure you. So really community, community-led interventions are, are the most effective. Uh, you know, I'm just kind of going to address something you started to speak of when you were talking about communicating as intern and just uh, the diver diversity of, of staff that you really need to address the issues that, you know, you, know, you speak of malaria and right away you kind of think um, a lot of times in terms of of the science of it and the, the biology of it, uh, and then you know your issues, you might you might think more of behavior sciences, but but really that there's such diversity uh, in dealing with these things. You know, just the, the what diversity you have in your staffs, you know, that you work with, you know, to approach the issues. You know, and you did kind of start to speak about that when you said uh, that you you know you bring uh, interns who are studying medicine and then those who are studying social sciences can you kind of touch or pick up on what others really address. They then actually pick more of the person. So the interview saying, are you the kind of person who can deal well with uh, conflict? Are you a good manager? Are you a good leader? Are you somebody who is a problem solver? You know, can you can you think of these different ways? And so our interview model is actually a little bit more difficult. People want to ask you, you know, sort of, do you think we should be using SP, SP uh, as a treatment for malaria, which is a very, very technical question, or do you think we should be using, you know, ACT versus RDT? Won't ask you how do you put those two together. They'll ask you, so you know how do you how do you build a good team? You know what are what are the most important ways of you know, having a good team? What are the most important ways of empowering people? How are what are can you show me an example where you were a good leader? You know that you had a problem and you you were a leader who, who navigated your way out of this problem. So we've actually changed our model in terms of so long as you have the base technical skills, they actually want people who can put you into a bunch of different situations because. You know, like the crisis we're having right now, where we are um, with a nutritional crisis as a hell, it's going to be very difficult. You're going to be seeing a lot of people dying. So, as a nutritionist, you know what you need to do, but you also need to build a team and you need to empower people to go out there and really confront this crisis. So, that's why I really think you know, the broadest skill sets you have and 
really like law and you can see things through the perspective of law and you can navigate these things to make bills good arguments, even if you go into the health field, that's what will help you to argue with the Minister of Health. You can put, present the pros and cons, you put the economics in there, and that's how you present your argument. So I think it's been a fascinating discussion. I, I think we've got some food out there. Do you want to just continue the discussion as over lunch? I mean, I, I think can I can finish with one more question, and that's the same question for both of you, especially in relationship to these these goals, broad, as broadly defined as you like. Are, are you optimistic or pessimistic about where we're going to be, say, 2015 or beyond? Are you? Yes or no answer. Do you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it this way. So, if I put it through the lens of, of malaria, uh -huh. it's been an extraordinary decade. We've been, we just wrapped up what was called the, the decade to roll back malaria. And what we saw was when financing went up and political will went up, the scale up was extraordinary. And we started to get bed nets out there. I mean, we got to a point where we never thought we were ever going to get. So we got to about 86% of Sub-Saharan Africa being, according to the numbers, covered with bed nets. You know, operationally ensuring that there's bad news. But what's happening now is we need to renew those bed nets. So there has to be a sustained financing. The problem is sustainability is not there. We got to 2008, we got the financial crisis, and the financing started to go down. So all of these extraordinary gains, as we were progressing, as we were moving, we could slip back, and we're starting to slip back already. We're starting to see the bed right now. So yes, we can get there, but the biggest key is actually going to be national investment, and it has to be national investment from those least developed governments. There's always room. I mean, you can't keep investing in your armies. You can't keep investing in militarization, you have to invest in this development. It has to be national development, you know, and investing in infrastructure and ensuring that people are getting educated. It has to be national governments. The, the model of external aid only works to a certain point. And if we can switch that model and get those national governments to really invest, yeah, we could get there. We were doing extraordinary progress, and we showed that, that with these partnerships that people really pulling together, we were moving forward. But we slip back so easily, so easy to slip back. So on a couple of them, a couple of them were ancient towards the future. Um, so I guess I was just uh, thinking of the promotion of gender equality piece. And um, you know, I think it's defined really more on secondary education, but that's not really gender equality. So getting to maybe some of the, I mean, I'm not sure. Thinking of the MDGs, I mean, there's two ways to think of it, I guess. One of them is actual goals that we'll, we'll reach or really kind of as a rallying point for the evidence to do something. Uh, so maybe on that level, it has worked. But again, there's always, I guess with caveats, there's always going to be a certain level of doing things just to say that you're of going through the motions. Right? Um, and addressing gender equality, luckily on some levels, doesn't really require disbursement or money. It requires really kind of readjusting expectations in society that we have about the roles for men and women and removing barriers that may exist. Some of them may be uh, structural, right? Le uh, many of them are structural, but some of them may be legal or political as well. Um, so I think removing those barriers doesn't really cost us anything. It's going to have more power to do it. And maybe some of, the, uh, some of the focus through the NDGs could help to do some of that. Okay, great. Can, can oh, I just oh, add a little more cliche? What are you doing on the, what's, what's happening on the local level? What are you doing to develop capacity? on the local levels and so that there can be a continuity and maintenance of these programs where they um, have both, you know, you were saying train, you know, you bring them in and say, okay, you have a certain amount of technical expertise, so now we're gonna train you now in the in the social sort of uh, milieu or see what you're sort of apt at in the social milieu, but it just seems as if uh, on the local level they they need it probably more um, and, and it seems to kind of take away from the capability but I don't know. I mean, maybe you use these people to to train you know locals on the ground who have leadership capability, who have networks, who um, may not have a you know quote unquote you know a Western style education, but um, could um, I guess push um, their governments and push um, because I mean it, uh, the larger problem too is some of the legitimacy of mm -hmm. government. So I mean you basically have these villages who are completely removed from um, from the government system. Um, in many ways, and 
idea that, you know, if I develop you, you can connect with it better than, than we could from the outside anytime, I mean, on the inside. I mean, definitely for us, we, we tend to work a lot with the local organizations and try to build up the capacity of local organizations. Um, there's, there's, you can imagine a, a huge amount of uh, ineffectiveness of me going out to do workshops in Africa. Uh, it, we want people from those countries, from those uh, contexts to be the ones who do it. Um, they know their own, uh, how norms operate in the, in the situation. They're better equipped to be able to think of how to question them than I could ever do that. So we work a lot with kind of training trainers, training people to go on and do, to, to do it themselves. So we try to focus a lot with organizations and build them up so that they can continue to do the, to, to do this work themselves. Uh, and we can't possibly you know, lobby or really advocate and, and really, really uh, have impact that way. We want local civil society, local people to be, to be the ones to question and, and advocate for change within their, their own systems. Um, yeah, so, so I definitely agree with this. Uh, it's, it's key to build up local capacities that's that's what we should be doing. And I think sharing South-South, there hasn't, I mean, we've, it's been said for a long time, it just doesn't happen very much. Um, and I've seen that with my, own, with my own organization sometimes, where program strategies from a country that's a neighbor to another country come to, to New York, but their neighbor doesn't know about it. Right? So there isn't that sharing across borders in a lot of regions uh, as much as there could be. Right? And I think we can facilitate that more. Can you use that please? by something called the Equity Agenda, which comes from uh, directly from an executive director. So we go to the most marginalized populations and we work back from there. So especially, for instance, in, in if I look at it through the Sandy Lens Regional Area, we always put the Fed heads in the most remote areas first. So and the most on left are always out there and then we work backwards back into the cities. And so we're really going after those most marginalized, the most poor, the most rural areas are the areas we're trying to get to first and then we work backwards. So, and then one of the things that my mentor at UNDP has always taught me and has served with me for a long time is I'm constantly trying to work myself out of the job. So I'm constantly trying to train the next generation to, to be that sort of advisor, to be that sort of person who can do it, um, taking people from one country. So for instance, the distribution of bed nets that happened in Congo Brazzaville that started last month was actually done by uh, the National Land Control Program of CAR. So the three people came in and said, look, we've actually already done this. So we were doing that cross-country experience where they run. And they just said, oh, you know, in Congo, they run this, and then they take it back. So constant facilitation of, of just moving and constantly trying to foster that next generation so that I'm doing much more backstopping. I mean, I'm coming out of headquarters. We have two regional offices, and then there's a number of country offices. So I come in only when I'm needed, and I'm constantly trying to give everybody as much information, as much resources, and really work myself out of the job as much as possible. There's so many really admire so many extraordinary people out there and they just they just need to keep pushing it in the same way that I was given opportunities. They also need to go out there and so we do need to keep doing this. Quick question, this is Bobby. How how much follow up or continued contact do you keep with programs that you initiated and then have more or less kind of completed the crux of the, the program mm -hmm. um, in order to see if that kind of follow up actually Um, realistically, it depends. Uh, when we when we have far into where we're, we're partnered with local organizations, then I can continue to do that uh, informally, basically. Um, so when we have that, I can do that. When we don't, like for example, the Sense of Marginal Project I mentioned was a research study. So with research studies, you really want to have the most uh, control that you can. So you're not necessarily really working always through a local partner, especially if there isn't one that's, that's going to be able to do it. So for research studies, are different. I mean, the way they're funded uh, is not ideal for um, sustain sustainability of that specific programming, uh, but it is uh, part of trying to help the uh, build in replicate, repl replicability right, so other people can do and learn from that experience and use it. Um, but yeah, I would say, um, for some of the local organizations that we've worked with, I'm still in touch with them, even ones that were several years back. Um, that's not all our programs that we have. 